we've been reading this one verse every week as we've looked at the life of Gideon. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn there, and then we will stand in reverence of the reading of God's Word as we read it together. It's a reminder of our great God and who He is. First Chronicles 29, verse 12. Please stand as we read God's Word. Isn't that a great sound? You don't get that with a smartphone, do you? <laughs> First Chronicles 29, verse 12 says, Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Father, we recognize you as the source of our life, the source of our strength, the source of everything, because you were before everything, and you created everything, and by you all things exist. You knew us before we were ever born. You knew our lives. Father, I thank you that you sustain us each day with your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now, Francis gave a testimony, and we moved on. But I didn't mean to cut anybody short, because God definitely was good this last week, was he not? Okay. I'll share one. You know, this may not sound like lots, but this is how God, to me, leads me through my days. Y'all know that I try to do daily devotions and put them on the internet for y'all to look at, for people who aren't coming to look at, to be encouraged in the Lord. And I had a set of seven for the week laid out, and I was so glad I try to get it done before Tuesday so that I can upload them and schedule them and have them ready uh, so it doesn't take up every day of my life. And it helps me during the week to do it that way. And I had seven done. And that night in my quiet time, God said, you need to interject these three in the middle. Now, when you have something dated, <laughs> and laid out in order, and God says, put these three in the middle of it, which made it ten, right? So the next day I come in, and I'm sitting there saying, oh, man, it's almost like starting all over again. And But it all fell together, and I got them in the middle, and I changed the dates and got them lined up. The next night, in my quiet times, he said, insert these three in the middle. You know, you, sometimes you just want to take a deep breath with God because he doesn't give you everything at one time, does he? So now we're up to about 13, and I have to go back, and I have to think about, it. well, how does this relate now? And there they are, and they're all piled up. On, well, i got some of them already done, but they're piled up on my desk. And I share that because, you know, life isn't as easy and as disciplined as I would like for it to be. I've told y'all I'm a control person. I have my day planned out. I know I'm going to try to do this, this, and this. And it has been hard work for me to learn to be flexible. <laughs> That's right, Alex. It's hard. And but with God, He can do it. And I have learned that if I will look, if I will be flexible when God tells me to do something, to do it, it just all comes together. Am I saying it's easy? No, because I'm saying I'm having to change, and change is never easy, is it? A 
And yet God, if we will follow him, will put it all together and it will just come. You may sit there and say, it doesn't happen to me. Well, I, I don't understand why not because the same Holy Spirit's trying to give it to you that he's given it to me, right? Right. So that's my goodness of the Lord this week. I was faithful enough to follow his changes and he just put it all together. Amen. So, anyone else? We're here today to glorify the Lord and praise His name. Well, I'll say something. Okay. Can y'all hear everything? Okay, we've got some that came this morning. But. You know, I can't wait to get to heaven because we'll be knocking each other down to praise the Lord, won't we? Yeah. Elbowing to get out of my way, it's my turn. <laughs> and here we're so quiet. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but if he's good and we're here to rejoice in him, it ought to be just bubbling out of us. Amen? Amen. He is so patient and gentle with me. And I praise his name for that. Because I can be a hard head. I can be immovable in a bad way. Miss Ruby. I just want to praise God, first of all, for my salvation. I want to praise him for being so faithful to me every single day. Amen. I thank him for the help that I have to get up each morning. I just want to praise him for that. Yeah. I also praise my God because we live in a country where we can come and worship on Sunday morning. We're not persecuted for our, um, the way that, for our faith. And I just thank God for a president who stands up for that and that he stood up with Israel. I just praise God that he can use men that may not have the personality that we think he ought to have, but that God can use anybody to stand up for Israel. He can use anybody to stand up for religious freedom. He can use anybody to stand up for all of our freedoms. And I just thank you, thank God, that we have a chance today to fast and pray for our country and for this election that's coming up, this is sponsored by Franklin Gray. And I just want to praise God that uh, he's allowed me to be here today. But he's so good to me every day. I so thank you for every blessing. He provides everything I need. And his word is such a blessing to, to read each day. And I just thank you for his word. And I thank you for this church and the faithful members who love the Lord here. It's just a, such a special thing to be able to come on Sunday and to worship for these people that are so dedicated to our Heavenly Father who blesses us every single day with everything that we have. And we need to honor Him and glorify Him. And we need to just continue to, uh, to live a life that, that will be, um, that we can see, uh, others can see Jesus in us. And pray for me that I will be able to live that kind of life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Ken Butler.
Are you are you pointing at my microphone or you want to say something? Say something. Okay. Talk loud. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have a mic cord to the reach up there, bro. Uh, we, we were just saying about the promises of God. You mentioned about uh, naming some promises of God. And uh, I know one of the scriptures you sent out this week, I remember that when you were talking about it. I just wanted to. It was in uh, Psalms chapter 9. It says, if we put our trust in God, he will not forsake those who seek him. So I, that really stood out in one of the scriptures you said out this week. I know there's many, many promises of God. And the other one that, that sticks in my mind is in Isaiah 26, 3. It says, if we put our, if we keep God in our minds and hearts, he will keep us in perfect peace. Amen. Thank you. All right. I'd like for us to take time to pray. And then we'll look into God's Word. Father, we can never pray too much. For when we pray, we push the world aside. And when we pray, we push ourselves aside. And we enter into a intimate communion with you. We converse with you and listen to you. We sense the moving of your Holy Spirit within our hearts and our souls. And Father, I just felt compelled to stop. As Miss Ruby was testifying and others have testified. And remember those who are part of the body of Christ here at Sunset Park. And whether because it's raining and the weather isn't good or whether it's because of something going on in their life, some hurt, whether it's physically or mentally or emotionally. Father, there are needs that only you can meet. There's those who either have or have been close to someone who has the, the virus. Father, there's those who have had surgery and are recovering. There are those of us who are just old and struggle each day physically to follow you and to finish the day well. Father, there are those here among us even who have needs and hurts and we've come to worship and praise you to remain firm in our faith and the promises that you've made to us. Father, it's not my prayers. It's not the prayers of any individual. It's you who answers the prayers. It's you and you hear them. You do not forget them. You do not forsake the prayers and the calling out of your people. Father, as we reflect on you and meditate on you, as we look into your word, may you place it in our hearts. As we sit still before your spirit, may you change us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, we daily need the renewal of your spirits filling within us. So we ask for that today. Speak to us from your word. And glorify yourself today in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm going to share several path from several passages this morning. But we will end up in Ephesians chapter 6, if you want to turn there, and we'll end up in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So Ephesians chapter 6 and 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I'll mention these again as we get to them. We've been talking about, as we finished going through the book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, we began to talk about the last chapter, which talked about Hebrews chapter 11, a chapter about heroes in the faith. And I've been preaching through about Gideon and his life and him being listed in, as a hero in the faith. And, and last week I ended the service by asking you, what do you need to do to end up in Hebrews chapter 11 as a hero of faith? <coughs> Because they were just, Gideon and the rest of them were just average people like us. They had life, they had families, they had jobs, they had things they had to deal with. I'm sure they had things in their time that broke down that they had to fix or replace. And so they were just like us. We just have more of it sometimes, do we not? And we looked at their lives and the question comes, how can I be a person to end up in Hebrews chapter 11? Well, going back to something we shared before and to try to bring all this together, we talked before Gideon about standing. The Bible talks a lot about standing. Standing firm, being immovable in our faith. We just sang about standing on the promises. We just heard two testimonies about standing on the promises. And I'm just going to read through these. But we talked about standing in the faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. We talked about standing in the Lord. Philippians 4, 1. We talked about standing in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. We talked about standing in the assembly of believers. 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. We talked about standing and putting others first. Romans 15, 2. We talked about standing and, and exercising spiritual gifts. Romans 1, 11. Through all this, we are told to stand. And we're told to not to move away from these things. Throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, God continually tells those who are following Him, do not turn to the right or to the left, but stay on course. And there's a lot of detours that I personally have taken in my life that I wish I could go back and undo. And you could probably say some of the same things. There's probably times when you detoured from what God was doing and how he was leading in your life and you wished you could go back and get it back. But you know as well as I do, once the time has passed, all I can do is say, that's gone, I have today, and I can do it today. To affirm that I'm going to stand today. I can't do anything about yesterday. I can't do anything about tomorrow. But today, I can stand. And so we are admonished to stand. We are admonished like my football coach when I was in high school. He would lean over to us as we sat there and we were getting pushed around and we were tired. And he'd say, suck it up, boys. And I'm sure the college college uh, players that were watching on TV and the pro players, they hear the same thing. Because you get tired and you want to just give up and you want to stop. And some of us want to retire, do we not? If I can just get to a certain age, I put in my time and I'll sit on a pew the rest of my life. You won't find that in Hebrews 11. In fact, the people that God used that Fran, and I'm going back to Fran, tells 
the children and she teaches the children. The people in scripture that, that are used of God never retired. They just went home to be with Jesus. What's that old saying? Old soldiers don't die. They, they just fade away with their boots on, right? We need to stand. We're admonished to stand. It doesn't say that God is going to keep things from happening. He says they're going to happen. You stand. Okay? We don't like to hear that. When we hear a hurricane's coming around, I've got a friend. He thinks that I ought to move. He lives in Alabama. <laughs> and he thinks I ought to move away from the coast. Because he, he hears about all the hurricanes and he just he just can't stand the thought of us being here. My mother and father, when they were alive, were the same way. They thought we died when Bertha and Fran came through. And I told Mark, I said, Mark, the problem is, is with you where you live. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I've got at least two or three days to know that a hurricane's coming. I said, you've got 20 seconds to know a tornado's coming through Tornado Alley. And that's what parts of Alabama are called, Tornado Alley. They're part of that. In 20 seconds, it can come and go. And my father learned that you can jump in the ditch and cover yourself like they tell you to, and you can still die in a tornado. Mm -hmm. You see, it, the things are going to come, and it doesn't matter where we live, it doesn't matter what's going on, we're supposed to stand strong in our faith and trust God. And what's faith? Okay, I'm going to have to tell Hope like she tells me. Give somebody else a chance. <laughs> Acting like God is telling the truth. Getting up every morning and going about our daily business like God has told us the truth. What is the truth? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. What is the truth? I'll meet all your needs in Christ Jesus, the Lord and Savior. That's right. What is the truth? I'm preparing a place for you. One day I'm going to come and take you to be with myself. Amen? Amen. Amen. What is the truth? He hears our prayers and answers us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we get up every day living like that is the truth of life. And it is. So we're admonished to stand. We're at Ephesians 6. I hope you've turned there. Verse 10. My sermon changed last week too. I was talking with a member of the church and they shared something with me and as I prayed and in my quiet times God changed the sermon so it's not exactly what I thought it was going to be. But in Ephesians 6 verse 10 we read these words. We're supposed to stand. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It's His might. It's His strength that we stand on. It's His promises we stand on. Amen? Amen. Amen. He says, and put on the whole armor of God that you may be, what? Able. Able to stand. What? Against the schemes of the devil. You'll hear me say this. God has a wonderful plan for our lives, but Satan does too, and Satan's working his plan just as much as God's working his plan. Is that so right there? So if we think everything is rosy just because God's got a wonderful plan for us and He's working it for our good and He's fulfilling His promises. That's all true and that's all good. But our adversary, the roaring lion, wakes up every morning and he's there just like Jesus is and he's seeking what? To devour, to rob, to steal. Amen? So we're, we're admonished to stand again against the schemes of Satan. But can we stand on our own? No, we have to stand in the, might, in the might and strength of God. We have to stand clothed in His armor. 
I don't know of any fireman, and I'm going to use this relationship because we can understand it better. I don't know of any fireman that goes to fight a fire in shorts and a t-shirt. Do you? No. You watch them when they go into that building. They're dressed and protected to go in and do their work. If they are, are that way and the police are that way and soldiers are that way, if everybody else dresses for the work they're going to be doing, why should we as Christians not dress for the work God's got for us? And he goes on and he says, you dress so that you can withstand what's coming. So that you can stand firm. Without it, we're not going to stand firm. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And I'm not going to try to go in and explain all this to you. That's not the purpose of this message. You just know that we struggle not against flesh and blood. You are not my enemy. I am not your enemy. My wife is not my enemy. I'm not her enemy. My daughter and my son are not my enemies and I'm not their enemies. I have an enemy and you have one too. And it's not each other. Okay? So I have no right to get upset and angry at anybody, right? Because they're not the ones pushing the buttons. And if I'm walking in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit... I should have let the Holy Spirit disconnect the buttons so Satan could push them all he wants to and nothing happened. You ever gone in the room and you flip a switch and nothing happens? And you got to figure it out. What is wrong? Bulbs out? Uh, rat chewed through a wire? Uh, the switch is bad? A fuse is bad? A breaker is bad? But you got to figure it out. Wouldn't it be great that every time Satan pushed your button, nothing happened? Pretty soon he'd probably find somebody else to push their buttons, wouldn't he? But that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the sanctifying of the Holy Spirit within our lives. And he says, these are the ones we're fighting, so we have to be prepared for it. In verse 13, he says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. When I think of withstanding, I think of a hurricane and I think of those pictures of the people that go out on the, the docks and go out on the beach and they have to lean into the wind. You ever watch that on TV? They have to lean into the wind. Why? Because they they're going to fall down. They're trying to keep their balance because something stronger than them is pushing against them. There's going to be strength pushing against us and if we don't stand firm in God's might, His strength, clothed with his righteousness, then we aren't going to be able to stand. He says, so that you'll be able to stand in the evil day and having done all, stand firm. Here in this little passage, he says to stand firm three times. It must be important for us to do that. Whether we're a new Christian, an old Christian, whether we're young or old, it doesn't matter. We are admonished to stand firm in our faith. And then he goes into what we're supposed to put on. And, and this is where I was going to spend most of the time, but he doesn't want me to do that today, so I'm just going to mention it. Verse 14, the belt of truth. God's the absolute truth of the universe. He created it. He set it all up. It all works according to his will and his purpose. The breastplate of righteousness, doing what's right every time having an attitude of righteousness, being uh, finding lying and deceit detestable and repulsive in our lives. The readiness given to the gospel of peace or the shoes of peace, different versions talk about it in different ways, but it's actually being ready and being firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the work that he has for us to do, and we're not going to be to the right or the left, we're not going to be moved from our purpose. The shield of faith that go 
shows up every time we're tempted to not believe God. We're tempted to disobey God. We're tempted to go on our own way. The shield of faith goes up and we remember to act like God's telling us the truth. Oh, that Adam and Eve had done that. What a different world it would be. The helmet of salvation, the assurance of knowing that we're saved and we don't waver from that point and we can't move, be moved from that point. The worst struggle I've had in my life was two years. My first two years in seminary. Because for the first two years I was in seminary, I doubted my salvation. You said, how could you be in seminary and doubt your salvation? I had a guy in my class ahead of me that he got saved in seminary. It can happen. Okay? But Hope and I got married and we left. We'd been in church all our lives. We got married. We moved to Memphis. We started looking for churches. We found Broadway Baptist Church and Brother Bobby Moore and we listened to him preach and we just couldn't sit on the pew. And we were so motivated and stimulated by him. That man, when I honest, the best pastor I ever sat on. I've told you this before, you didn't see or hear him before 11 o'clock in the morning. He was in the office. Nobody had access to him. Jesus had access to him. But when he stepped out on the platform, it was like Jesus stepping out there. And I'm not building him up to be more than he is or was. But he walked with God so much that you, you could see it, you could hear it in him. And we moved there. And I was just in awe of it. My pastor at home wasn't that way. Our church at home wasn't like this. And every day in seminary I heard the deep things of God and I heard it from spirit-filled men and I praise the Lord for where He led me to go because I heard and I heard them tell of instances in their lives and experiences they had with God. It wasn't just getting head knowledge. It was hearing about God working in someone's life and about how God responded. Never seen anything like that before. Never heard that before. Had I been in church? Yes. Was I saved? I thought so up to that point. But what I saw and what I heard was as different as dark and light from where I'd been. Hope can verify this. I thought everything was okay because I was doing all the right things and I was where God wanted me to do. I was teaching Sunday school to a bunch of little boys. Had no business doing that. You say, why? Because I needed to learn and grow myself. And then all of a sudden, I'm thrown in with a bunch of spirit-filled people, and I'm sitting there in all of them, and I've wondered for two years. I didn't know if I was saved or not. And God had to bring me to a point of peace with Him to know that. You say, what does that mean to me? That's how I know some people can be sitting on these pews and think everything's okay and they need to question. You see, because God doesn't save people to sit them on the pew and just leave them there. He saves us to make us Christ-like, to change us into His image, have His character, and be lights to the world. And that's what I ran into. I couldn't see it in my life. Church had been just a social event for me. That's where all my friends went. That's where I played basketball on the, on the RA basketball team. That's where I met my best friends that stuck with me through high school. I wasn't in school. My goodness, that's where I met my wife, the best Christian girl I'd ever seen. And yet I came, when I came in contact with people who walked in the Spirit, filled in the Spirit, I've never seen that before. You say, what kind of church did you go to? The Southern Baptist Church. Lakewood Baptist Church, Huntsville, Alabama. It's still there. Did you ever hear the Gospel? 
He had a youth retreat, but I don't remember hearing it in Sunday school or in church training when they had it. Heard a lot of different stuff. <clears throat> you see what I'm sharing there is there is a difference when we see people of faith and spirit and we begin to desire that in our lives. He says, take on the helmet of salvation. Know you're saved. Don't let your heart and mind deceive you into thinking something different. If I can't base my salvation on what God's Word says, and it's only on my experiences, I'm on shaky ground. It has to be the firm foundation of what God says about salvation. He says, then take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The only power I have against Satan and his devices, against the evil in the world, is the Word of God. That's why it's important to know it. You ought to work with teenagers sometimes. You wonder where they get their thoughts of God. You ought to work with people, some people who bounce from church to church to church. They're so confused. Why? Because they hear people telling them what the Bible says, but they never pick it up and read it themselves. I admonish you to read your Bible. I don't care if you use a smartphone, a computer, or, or, or pages with ink on it. Read your Bible. So that whether it's me or your Sunday school teacher or anybody else that stands up and says, Thus saith the Lord, you can sit there and say, uh, that's, that's in there. Or the Holy Spirit can run up a red flag and say, You better pay attention now because we're getting off track. You see, because it's very easy to get off track, is it not? If there was nobody sitting in this room today or watching on the internet that could stand there and say, Hugh, you're off track, then I could tell you anything I wanted to. We have to know the Word of God. We have to have the sword of the Spirit. Because if I give my opinion to Satan, he's going to laugh all day long. And if I share my opinion with other people, it's just my opinion. The only authority is the Word of God. So we're dressed. We're ready to stand. We've got the evil one coming against us. And what does verse 18 say? We like to think that we're going to swing the sword and we're going to fight. And there's going to be blood. You know, we like action, don't we? Right? We want to be doing something. Yeah. And verse 18 comes up and tells us what to do. What does it say to do? What? Amen. What? Praying always. I hear people all the time say, I can't do anything for you but pray. That's the greatest thing we can do for each other. Why? Because we're calling upon the God of heaven who tells us the truth, who wants to bless, who wants to do, who wants to answer, and we're calling on Him to do something. You see, praying isn't the least of things we can do. It's the greatest thing we can do. Amen. And that's why it's here. You're all dressed for battle. There's, there's evil coming against you. And he says, pray in the Spirit. With all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. The most least attended meeting of the church in America is prayer meetings. Some churches have done away with it. It ought to be the meeting where the most people show up. That's right. When the body of Christ comes together to call out to our great God who can answer us and wants to answer us, you say, God's not doing anything. Well, He isn't being asked. God's always been active. He's always wanted to work. He's always wanted to bless. We're not asking. And this is where the rent above it was shortened, if you believe it shortened. And I came to this praying because I was, I was reminded through uh, people emailing me and 
Miss Ruby shared about Franklin Graham calling us to a day of prayer and fasting today. You see, he's not the only one that has done that. There are others. One, there's great need in our country and it's not just the pandemic which has is, which is shackled us as a society. But it's also the social and political change going on in our society. It's also, now get this, and I'm always going to come back to this, I can't help it because I believe God told us the truth. It's also the hand of God working in our world, bringing it to the point where Jesus will return. Amen? Amen. Amen. And what an exciting time that is, that we lived during that time of history when we're actually seeing it happen and things come into place. So if we're supposed to pray in the Spirit and we get ourselves ready so we can stand firm when Satan comes against us, I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. This is, this is uh, we're going to read some verses here. And I'm going to share some thoughts. And then I'll be through. Second Chronicles 20. And I'll mention the verses. And I'll give you time to go to them. Because we're not going to read through all the verses. Verse 2. Jehoshaphat is there, an army's coming against him, he doesn't know what to do. And it says in verse 2, Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom and beyond the sea. Verse 3, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. A great host is coming against you. There's things coming. We've already talked about that. And Jehoshaphat becomes afraid and seeks the Lord. We are really good about talking about things and not good about talking to God about things. Jehoshaphat the king knew that this great army was coming and there was nothing he could do to stand in their way. There was nothing he could do to defeat them. What can you do about the coronavirus? Now oh, come on. What can you? Pray is all. Oh, we can wear masks and we can, we can not be foolish, right? I'll just put it that way. We can not be foolish, right? But the only thing that we really can do about it is pray. Pray for the ones who are trying to develop a, 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 a vaccine. Pray for God to, to wipe it out because He could. Thank God. But have we come to meet together as the family of God, the body of Christ, and pray and ask for that? He could change the social upheaval in our country. He could heal hearts. Jehoshaphat set his face to seek the Lord. He was determined to seek the Lord. He wasn't going to do anything. He wasn't going to right or left. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He didn't just seek the Lord. He said, everybody under me, my subjects are going to seek the Lord too. He called the whole nation to seek the Lord. And that's what we've been done today. We've been called to seek God today. We should do it every day, but this is a special day for it. It says in verse 4, And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord from all the cities of Judah, and they came to seek the Lord. The people came out and responded and sought the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, Lord God of our fathers, you are, not, are you not the God of heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? He starts off talking about God and praising God and realizing that God is the only answer they have. For 
we, in verse 12, are powerless against this great horde. We are powerless against the virus. We are powerless seemingly against things going on in the world and society. We're powerless against the economic changes. He says we're powerless against that is coming against us. We do not know what to do. In all of our wisdom, all of our education, all of the information that's out there, we don't know what to do, do we? He says, but our eyes are on you. Verse 14, and the Spirit of the Lord came. When did the Spirit of the Lord come? When they humbled themselves and they sought God and they professed that He is the answer and they turned their eyes on Him and said, we can't and we don't know what to do. And it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. Now this is the Old Testament, right? What's the big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament as far as the Spirit of God? We're saved, the Spirit.